Shabbat Parashat Lech Lecha. Onto the stage steps Avraham Avinu with his wife Sarah. And humanity will never be the same. Abraham, from a very young age, understood the futility of idolatry, and he sets for himself a mission to teach the world about the belief in one God. But not just the belief in God, but righteous, moral, and productive behavior. Indeed, Abraham goes to Eretz Israel and immediately starts impacting his surroundings. He does so much for society, teaches about welcoming guests into one's home, proper conduct. He impacts everyone around him. He is impossible to ignore. And we go through saga after saga, meeting amazing stories about his life. In the midst of the Parsha, though, we are introduced to a story that is very difficult to understand. For itself, we have a world war. A massive battle between four kings against five kings. And the world is at war. What does this have to do with us? Seemingly nothing. It's only at the end of the story that we hear that in the process of capturing the various towns that the warriors, have, the, the winning team, occupied, they capture the city of Sodom. And in it they find Lot, Abraham's beloved nephew. And they capture him, and they take him along with the rest of the captives. And Abraham has someone come and tell him of this terrible tragedy. Immediately, Abraham empties out his house from all of his students, his disciples join him. We will see, this is not as simple as that. But he launches a counterattack by himself with his 318 disciples, and manages to defeat these awesome warriors releases all the captives, saves his beloved nephew, and brings everyone back home. What an amazing event. Well, I understand that Avram here displayed great courage. We're not quite understanding why he needed to do all of this. We're not quite understanding why we needed to know about all of this. But more importantly, if you look at the way that the Torah tells us a story, the Torah describes to us in great detail not only which kings were battling here, not that they mean anything to us, Seemingly, these are just names that of, nation, of kings and of nations that we know nothing about anymore. But it goes through a great detail of where they fought, how they went, where they came back. An entire battle that seems not to do with anything that we have interest in. But yet, in the midst of this description, there is a very strange pasuk. And the warriors came back, and they came to an area that is known as Ein Mishpat, the Eye of Justice, which is in the city of Kadesh, or in the area of Kadesh. Vayaku et kol sedeha Amaleki, and they struck the entire field of the Amalekites, v'gam et ha'emori yersheh b'chatzatzon tamar, and the Amorites that are sitting in chatzatzon tamar. Very strange Pasuk. Now, the Pasuk raises a question right away, because Amalek, as we know, is the grandson of Esav. Oh, he is not going to be born for many, many, many years to come. So how could there be a Sadeh Maliki? Listen to Rashi, however, when he explores the words Ein Mishpat Hikadesh. Says Rashi, Al Shem Ha'atid. This is talking about the future. And what future is this? She'atidin Moshe ve'aron lihishafet sham al iske oto ha'ayn ve'hem mei meriva. What a bizarre statement by Rashi. This Pasuk, at the beginning of Bereshit, when they were talking about the life of Abraham, is really talking about the future. About Moshe and Aaron. Yes, indeed, many, many years from now, Moshe and Aaron are going to stand on the borders of Eretz Israel at the end of a long and tedious journey of 40 years through the desert, and the people are going to get Moshe upset because they're thirsty. And in a moment of anger, he lifts his staff and he strikes the stone, stat, tw stone twice, disobeying God's commandment. And as a result, perhaps as a result of many other issues as well, Moshe and Aaron are told by God that they ended their career. It is time for them to pass on the baton to the next generation 
they will not be going into Eretz Israel. What in the world does that have to do with the battle of the four and five kings? Well, in this very short format, it is difficult to develop the entire concept. But I just wanted to share with you a snippet, perhaps something to tease your interest and send you on an exploration to do further research into this issue. The ringleader of this particular battle is no other than Amraphel, who Chazal tells us is a second name for a famous character that we met last week. A character known as Nimrod. Yes, Nimrod, the king that first rebelled against God, the first king to stand up and try to declare himself a deity, the first king to have to confront the young Avraham, who stands up with courage and defies his decree to worship idols. We are all familiar with the wonderful story of Avraham the child challenging the king, being thrown into the pit of fire only to survive. It seems to be that this battle between Abraham and Nimrod was very far-reaching. It was a continuous theological argument that impacted all of the people in their town. Nimrod never quite forgave Abraham, but he knew that he had to contend with him on a different level. Nimrod lost this battle. He lost it in the pu most public fashion. And when Avraham was set to leave Ur Kasdim and go on his journey to the land of Israel, the Midrash tells us that all of the leaders came to send him off and brought various gifts. Nimrod also came with a very strange and peculiar gift that he brought along, says the Midrash. He brought for him his eldest son, his Bechor, as a slave, as a servant to work in Avraham's house. Of course, Nimrod's intentions were not pure at all. He hoped that his son will grow up and manage to corrupt Avram's house from the inside. But years went by and this was not working. This did not happen at all. We will see in a minute what happened to this interesting child. But when Nimrod found out that Lot, the nephew of Avraham, the one that looked so close to Avraham, almost identical to him in his physical appearance, was living now in Sodom, Nimrod knew that he had it. Finally, he found an Achilles heel. Finally, he found something that will allow him to bring down the house of Abraham. So he triggers off a huge battle. In fact, Nimrod's intention was not to launch this battle. That was not of any interest to him. That was just a side benefit. Ultimately, he had a target. And the target is very clear in the Torah. Because after everyone was captured, and everyone was taken, and all the towns were destroyed, the Torah adds on, they took all of the property and all of the spoils and they left. And then the Torah adds on. They took Lot and his property. And the Torah adds to us, in case you forgot, he is Ben Achi Avraham. And why did they do this? Because Lot is sitting in stone. In fact, Nimrod attempted to bring down the house of Avraham by capturing the weak link. Avraham answered him in kind. He takes his Hanichim, the 308 students, and Rashi departs from his tradition of being a commentator that only focuses on the simplicity of the text and says to us, who are the 13 and 18 students? Not 318 students left, but rather only one student went with him. The head of his household, the Mesek Eliezer, because Eliezer adds up in his numerical value to 318. What a strange comment by Rashi. Why Eliezer alone? And why were they able to defeat Nimrod all by themselves? Because Eliezer was the son of Nimrod. Yes, indeed. Abraham takes Eliezer with him and he says to Nimrod, This is all I need. Your own son that was raised properly in a house full of holiness and belief in God is enough to defeat your idolatry ways. He launches the campaign and he frees his nephew and he brings great honor to Kaddish Baruch Hu, when he meets Malki Tzedek, and Malki Tzedek in return says, Baruch Avraham Elyon Kone Shamayim Va'aretz. Years later, when Moshe and Aaron stood by the stone, they had a golden opportunity. Their mission was, teach the Jewish people the power of prayer. Drive them away from any chance that they hold on to idolatry beliefs. The staff that I gave you years ago, 
was used for the purpose of allowing the people to huge, take that huge jump from Egyptian idolatry to the belief in God. But once its task was over for the last 40 years, it was here in the tent. You didn't use it. In fact, Kaddish Baruch Hu tells Moshe, you must take the staff from within me, from within all oh, Moed. Bring it to you. Bring it to the people and show them. This was the staff that years ago you needed. You no longer need this. Teach them the art of speech, the art of prayer, the art that says that God is everywhere around us. All we have to do is call out to Him. But Moshe, in a moment of anger, blew it. He hit the rock with the staff. And by doing so, he sent the young generation that grew up in the desert light years backwards. And they had to be rebuilt again. In fact, in the midst of this great battle, the Torah sends us a clue. If you don't establish a firm belief in the power of Kaddish Baruch Hu in our world, if you don't fight hard and continuously to drive away any hint of idolatry, the Nimrods of the world will always be there to rise once again. It is the power of Abraham that was able to take in Eliezer and rise him to such heights in which the Torah tells us, the Chazal tell us, that Eliezer was welcomed to walk into the Garden of Eden without any sin. Shabbat Shalom.